Unfortunately, Frosty had passed by suicide seven weeks prior to the night that I died. Okay. I had had some uh, bone spurs on my neck from sports injuries when I was younger. And there was this famous doctor that is in Korea, uh, that came from Korea, he's in Pittsburgh, and developed this new technique where they go in through the front of your neck and they drill out these bone spurs. So they just go in, they make a small cut, they move your esophagus aside, they go in, they drill these things out, no big deal. You're in the hospital one night and, you, and you're released. So I went up there, I had that done. And uh, this, was, this was in January of 2016. Mm -hmm. So four days later, I came home and had a massive heart attack in my bed at around 11 p.m. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so um, in, in retrospect, now we, now we know what happened is that uh, I threw a blood clot or a piece of plaque broke off. They're not exactly sure, but it went right into my widow maker and boom, of course, everything stops. So I didn't know what was going on. My wife, we have a special needs child uh, who has a seizure disorder and you know, it's, it's 11 o'clock at night, you're asleep, all of a sudden there's all this screaming in the house and it's me screaming in pain. Don't remember any of this. So my wife, my wife runs down the hall to check on Maria and she's fine and you know, she's confused, turns on the light and there I am flopping around in bed like a fish screaming. Don't remember any of that. She calls the ambulance and uh, thank goodness, the hospital is like three miles away from our house. So neighbor comes over to watch Maria, I'm wheeled into the emergency room and they know that I'm having a massive heart attack. So they hook me up to give me some, whatever it is that they give you blood thinners and things to, to, you know, calm me down. It's the middle of the night. They call the cardiologist. He's not in the hospital. So my wife and nurse are in a room and she says, Hey, look, you know, we've, we've got him, we've got him calmed down. He's okay right now until the cardiologist gets here and he's stable. As soon as she said that, uh, as my wife says now, and I detail that in the book, it was like a moment from the movie, The Exorcist. All of a sudden, I sprang up off the gurney from my waist up, like somebody grabbed me by my shirt and just pulled me forward with great force. So I'm unconscious. I spring forward like this, my eyes pop wide open. And I scream out the name Frosty. I scream out Frosty and I collapse backwards on the gurney. Boom, I flatline, code blue rings out through the hospital and in rush a team of doctors to start working on me. Now, before the, uh, the doctors take my wife out of the room, uh, my wife turns to the to the doctor, who is now a very good friend of mine, a little beautiful Indian woman named Dr. Patel. And she turns to Dr. Patel and says, look, you have to save my husband. We have a special needs child, and she's not going to make it without him, and I can't do this alone. So she takes my wife out of the room. My wife drops to her knees, starts praying out loud to God to save me, and Dr. Patel starts working on me. Well, Dr. Patel and her team did everything. I'm talking about, you know, the, the paddle shocks. I got four injections into my heart with the needle of epinephrine, you know, sternal rubs, the whole thing. I was flatlined for 20 minutes. So during that period of time, you know, the cardiologist finally arrives. Dr. Patel, for some reason, she should have called it long ago. Because, you know, after a while, they think you're brain dead. So, but she kept on working on me. Something compelled her to continue to work on me. And she obtained a slight pulse. Dr. Bajwa comes in, the cardiologist, puts a pump up through my thigh, finds the blockage, puts two stints in my heart. Uh, but it was too late. I'd gone into cardiogenic shock. Another doctor comes in, who's a friend of mine now, Dr. Carson, comes in, intubates me. I'm on the vent and I slip into a four day coma. So that's how it all began. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to rehash my entire oh. <laughs> wonderful time I had. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, so you were, so they say anything over what, five minutes, seven minutes, you're, you're vegetable, right? Or something along those lines. 
I, you know, I don't know, you know, Alex, I don't know what that timeline is, but I know 20 minutes. It's is like, yeah, you're, you're mush at that point. If, you have, if you're <laughs> yeah, not getting, right. if you're not getting oxygen to your brain, uh, technically, and, and again, I've heard this story play out a few times in the show, uh, but scientifically, if that happens, the brain is pretty much mush. If you do come back, you're, yeah. you're vegetable. Um, yeah. So, so now you're in your, your four day coma. What now, what happens while you're in your coma? Well, so as you say, um, they think that uh, I'm probably brain dead. So, and I don't know how this works, but they send in neurologists during this four day period. And ironically, one of those neurologists, world famous uh, Dr. Corbier, Dr. Jean Renal Corbier, who happens to be my daughter's neurologist, my daughter has Rett syndrome, very rare. He, he comes in as well to see if I'm brain dead. Um, but, you know, nobody can really determine that. My oldest brother drives down from Pittsburgh. I was raised Catholic. He calls the local parish priest. Parish priest comes in, gives me my last rites. In the Catholic face, it's called extreme unction. You only get it once in your lifetime. So he comes in, anoints me with the oils, gives me my last rites. Everybody goes home. And on the fourth day, my doctor says, look, tells my wife, we can't wait any longer it's four days now. We're going to take out the vent. If he starts breathing on his own, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what we got. You know. So obviously, I they start pulling the tubes out. I start choking, and uh, and, and here I am. So I go into recovery. The first person that I see is Dr. Bajwal, but my but I'm still kind of like unconscious. He's like shaking me. You know, how are you feeling? who's a Sikh, by the way. So he's got this purple headdress on. I'm looking up at this guy. I think I'm, I think I'm you know, watching a movie. I don't know what's going on. Everything's still blurry. But my wife comes in. She's the first one that enters the room. And um, she says, I'm talking like a, a child in this high-pitched rush you know, voice. It was Frosty. It was Frosty. Your brother, Frosty, he came to me. You have to believe me. You have to believe me. And she's like, calm down. I know, I know Frosty came to you. I said, what are you talking about? She said, right before you flatlined, you came, you came up on the gurney, sprang forward, screamed out Frosty's name, and then collapsed backwards. And then boom, flatlined. So to give you a little bit of history there, so Frosty is the nickname of my my wife's brother. And unfortunately, Frosty had passed by suicide seven weeks prior to the night that I died. Oh, okay. So Frosty lives in this small country town. He was living with his parents at the time, which is about 35 miles south of where I live. And he had, uh, it was around Christmas time and Frosty was going through a divorce. He was living in the upstairs bedroom of his parents' house. And, you know, Frosty had had some issues. He had some drug addiction things going on, but he'd been clean for like five years but, you know, end of the year, and he had his own business, surveying business, and his, you know, trying to figure out how to pay college. His, his daughter's got one child, her, her bills, and a lot of stuff going on. So he, so he went out to try to blow off some steam, you know, got, got some kind of drug that drove him mad for like 40 minutes and, and came home and, and unfortunately took his own life. So his mother calls me in the middle of the night, and she said, come down here, please, and can you go up into the bedroom and try to find a note or a journal or something that would give us a clue as to why Frosty did this. So I did. I went up into that bedroom seven times, you know, picked through a rather gruesome scene, unfortunately. And finally, on the seventh trip up, I did find a journal, uh, which I had given to the family. So, but anyway, so my wife said, um, tell me exactly what Frosty said to you. And Frosty said to me, I've made a big mess out of things, but I want you to go back and help clean things up. But tell my parents I'm in a good place. So that was very curious to me. Having been raised Catholic, you know, and, and the whole, you know, I'm 62. So back then it was a mortal sin. And, you know, you, you went to, to, to hell, your soul was condemned, all these things. And so that was like the first big paradigm shift, the spiritual shift that took place in my mind that, hey, something's not right here. I mean, hell's not a good place, you know? Um, and it was kind of curious because uh, Melanie had told me that what was going on at that moment is that she was screaming to me, no, 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 don't go to Frosty, don't go to Frosty, stay here with me. 
because, you know, it, and we, I've read it over and over again, and my wife actually has experienced it. I've experienced it with my mom during her passing, that a spirit comes to welcome you and ease your passing to the other side. That's very, very common. So she thought that Frosty was coming to ease my passing into the spiritual realm. Mm-hmm. It was kind of interesting. She was just like pleading, you know, for me to stay there with him. So that's the first thing that happened coming out of coma. Now, there was another experience that I had, which was really interesting. So on the second day coming out of coma, um, I didn't know it was Dr. Patel at the time. This uh, lovely Indian woman walks into my room and she pulls up a chair and sits down and she introduces herself. I'm Dr. Patel. I'm the one that was working on you that night. And she got very emotional. You know, I can't tell you how many times I almost lost you. And this is what we went through. And my arms were paralyzed at the time, by the way, for like three or four days coming out of coma. So she reached down and put her hand on mine and, and she uh, all of a sudden got very emotional and she started talking about her father. I thought that was very odd. And she said, you know, I have to tell you something. My father and I were so close. He helped me get through medical school and we almost knew each other's thoughts. Every time I was thinking of him, he called vice versa, and we were incredibly close in spirit. And she said, all he was living for was to see my first child. And she said, I was pregnant with my first son, and he just couldn't wait to see my son's face. But then unexpectedly, he had an aneurysm, and he died six months before my child was born. And she said, you know, ever since then, Rob, I've lost I've lost faith and I'm a very spiritual person. I'm Hindu, but I don't believe that stuff anymore. And, you know, I've been very bitter about that whole thing. She says, but, you know, seeing you here alive against all the odds, there's no way you should be here. Just gives me hope that maybe, just maybe, you know, there's something more out there. Mm. And it was in that moment that the puzzle unscrambled and I began to put things together because a male spirit had entered the room while Dr. Patel was working on me. And I kept hearing over and over and over again, keep working on him. Don't give up. You can save him. Keep working on him. You can save him. And it struck me in that moment that it was Dr. Patel's father encouraging her to continue to work on me. And interestingly enough, you know, Alex, I couldn't tell her in that moment because I'm thinking, hey, okay, this is the second day coming out of coma. I'm still trying to figure all this stuff out. She's going to think I'm crazy. So I let it go and I didn't tell her. And it was a year later that I met her at the hospital that I told her that story. And it's like now every year since, um, you know, we get together on her father's birthday and, and talk about that. So it was her father speaking through me, even though she didn't hear him you know, prompting her to continue working on me. So now she knows that her father is always with her, Mm -hmm. which of course, you know, we're spiritual beings first having a human experience. So why do we find that to be such a, uh, you know, an uncanny thing? We really should think of it as being something, um, you know, usual instead of unusual. So that was my first experience, my first NDE. Okay, so that so that was so you did. There was no tunnel of light. You didn't go into the other side during this first NED. None of that stuff happened. None of that stuff happened. No. Okay, no. so that that's so that's the first near death experience. And you had, but you did see the the spirit of your doctor's uh, or the soul of your doctor's father come in, and he basically helped bring you back because he's the one that kept telling her, "Hey, keep working on her." Yeah. So two things happened there, which um, which I think kind of prepared me for what was coming kind of prepared me for my most profound near-death experience when I almost died again. And it was frosty that really this shift happened in me. You know, I'm sitting there. I mean, look, I knew that my whole, my whole life had fallen apart. My arms were paralyzed. I didn't know how I was going to take care of my daughter with special needs. I mean, I, I, I could ever go back to work. My whole life just unraveled. Everything was falling apart. But all I could think about was, Frosty telling me he was in a good place that really intrigued me. And this whole thing of, you know, hearing Dr. Patel's father speak. So that was, uh, that was enough to just, you know, lying there, I knew how catastrophic everything was. And I knew that I, maybe I'd never recover. 
and that my life was over and, you know, how's my wife going to do this, take care of my daughter? Will I ever work again? But I was so intrigued by those two spiritual experiences that really opened up my mind, my soul. And uh, it was uh, my first kind of like awakening. I've been able to partner with Mind Valley to present you guys free master classes between 60 and 90 minutes covering mind, body, soul, relationships, and conscious entrepreneurship taught by spiritual masters, yogis, spiritual thought leaders, and best-selling authors. Just head over to nextlevelsoul.com forward slash free. To watch the entire interview of this near-death experience, click on the video below and don't forget to subscribe.